Another evening of museum in Lotus evening. <laughs> uh, with me again, of course, Mr. Giuseppe De Giusa, Mr. Pino, as we know him. We are going to go into the world of Master Yun's Feng Shui art, but we're not going to talk about his art specifically as we have done so for many episodes uh, through the different antiques and artifacts owned by Master Yun privately and personally. We are going to go into them and hopefully with that, uh, this, uh, these items are not for sale for sure and understands Master Yun's world, uh, the different collections of Lotus and Water even more. Now today, uh, we are going to go into a different country, a country they've never stepped in before, but uh, we're going to continue from where we left off uh, previously. Do you remember, I hope you at home <laughs> remember what we talked about last week. Uh, what, what did we talk about last week, Mr. Pino? What did we talk about last week? You remember? No, I don't. <laughs> really? <laughs> We, we, no. we, okay, so let's, let's recollect. We spent several weeks in China, remember? Correct. Talking about the Ming Dynasty, Guan Yin, beautiful. Uh, we even talked about small lions. Yes. Yeah, the small lions that were used to guard the uh, uh, little babies, you know. The children. Uh, the children. Uh, then we also talked about this is beautiful wooden Guan Yin. Yes. Yeah, uh, so we had that. All it was about from China. Then last episode, we start to move out of mainland China per se. We yes. went to Tibet. Oh, yes. We went to Tibet. And we were talking about uh, Tibet artifacts that had Chinese influence. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, for yes. instance, the elephants. Yes. Right? For instance, the Tao Zhang Hua, the yes. flower of the image of the lotus. Yes. Right? So yes. they are artifacts from Tibet, but they are not Tibetan originated. They actually came from China. Right? from China, Correct. So today, we are going to go continue this path to see what has China absorbed from the world and what has China done to actually influence the rest of the neighbouring countries and cultures and we see it today. And today is actually quite exciting um, and it's actually very, very exciting, I would say, because we are going to go to a place that we have never gone before. Now, we have gone to Tibet many a times, right? Many times. Many times. It's, it feels as I'm, I, I've gone to Tibet many times. China, we spent several weeks on it. We have even been to England, Japan, Today, we are going to go to a different place. And if you see in front of us, we have two sets of artifacts. Two sets. Okay, this is obviously one set. That obviously is other set. And with these two sets, we are going to understand, let's go back to travel back in time to understand this country, this landlocked country that is trapped between two mega giants in Asia. We're going to Nepal. Yes. That we have never been to Nepal. Nepal is a very interesting place, very significant. It's where Mount Everest is. And also, just in case you didn't know, Nepal is also where Buddha was born. Yes. Uh, the prince that we're talking about. Okay? Yes. Uh, Sijia Moni was born in Nepal. So uh, there we have it. These two sets of uh, collections. Uh, maybe just a brief intro on what these two sets are first. Yes. Before we go into details, uh, shall we? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, here we have a pair of uh, dragons. And of course, the dragon uh, has its root in uh, China. Okay, so these are dragons. Dragons. And these are? And these are two masks. And uh, the two masks are referred to a couple. And in this case, they're Hinduist mask. One represents uh, Shiva, and then we will try to, um, and Shiva is Indian uh, deity, and then Hindu we will deity, try yes. to relate uh, why Shiva, an Indian deity, is in Nepal. And here, next to Shiva, we have a female face, and that's Parvati, and this is the consort of uh, Shiva. Right. And she is the beloved goddess. Okay, so we will come back to this Hindu god couple later. At least we have a brief concept, okay? These artifacts are all from Nepal. Yes. Okay, a rough age, the time. Okay, I would actually say that uh, the two dragons uh, would be the end of the 19th century, maybe the beginning of the 20th century. So 1800 eight, plus to yes. early 1900s, about yes. uh, 100 plus years away from now. Absolutely. And uh, the Hindu masks? I would think that this is slightly later and I would see the first part of the 20th century. First part of the 20th century, that means that we are talking about 1900s plus still. Yes. Probably yes. about 
80 to 100 years away from now. So Absolutely. all this from Nepal, uh, very different uh, cultural backgrounds. But I think to uh, just before we continue, yes, okay, uh, because uh, we we would like we would like to give you an image of the place you're talking about. We talk about China, everyone knows where China is. Japan, you will know where Japan is, and England as well. But Nepal, this country is very unique because, as I said, it's trapped between two big giant cultures and nations. So, uh, I have a whiteboard today. I brought a whiteboard along. I'm going to try to draw to you the map of China and, uh, uh, and India and uh, Nepal. Uh, so we know where exactly uh, it is and how relative it is. So let's take a look. Um, I'm not going to draw Singapore because Singapore is too far away from, from all these places. Okay, uh, let's try. And China is actually extremely big, of course. It's actually about uh, here, assuming something like that. Uh, they say that China looks like a rooster, but you know, I think I failed my art class. So, uh, okay, this is something like China. This is Shanghai. Hong Kong is here. And then you have uh, the whole uh, Tibet area, the big one. Okay, something like that. This is China. Yes. It's supposed to be a better rooster here, but I, I just failed in class here. This is China. Oops. China is here, right? This is this is the Tibet region that we went to Many last times. week, right? Yes. And Japan, of course, is all the way there. Then we have India, which actually, you know, in Museum in Lotus, we have been to India several times as well. If you remember the pillar of light, that's from India. So let's use a different color for India, okay, to demarcate that. Uh, India, you know, shares many of borders with China. So something like that, okay? It's a bit like a leaf shape, mm -hmm. right? It's a bit like a leaf shape. So it goes all the way down here, and then we have to India, something like that. This is India. This is where we found, in the first episode of Museum Lotus, if you remember, this is where we found the Indian dowry chest. This is where we found the, uh, the bell, yes. Uh, this is also where we, where we found the, uh, what do you call that, the uh, light pillar, right? They gave a lot of your good luck. Uh, this is India. Kerala? Yeah, from Kerala, yeah. Okay. India, yeah. Okay, so where exactly is our dear Nepal? Where is it? I have to highlight this with a different color because it's the character of today. Uh, this is India, China, Tibet. Can I see online? Can you can, right? Yeah. Okay, India, uh, Tibet is, I, won't, I don't even know, is it fortunately, unfortunately, it's trapped here. Just this small little region here. This is Nepal. Landlocked, right smack between China and India. This is Nepal. The, the area that I just shaded red is Nepal. And these artifacts are from these two regions. Now, some basic thing, if you don't find it contradictory, uh, and, but it's quite interesting, that Mr. Pino, you have mentioned that these two masks they are Shiva and the lover, <coughs> which is they are Hindu of origin. Dragon, of course, we can associate with the Eastern uh, or the Chinese uh, culture, uh, but they're also belonging to an important factor of Buddhism. Yes. And uh, specifically, uh, in Tibet, it's going to be Tibetan Buddhism. Yes. So, which means that we see a strange uh, connection going on, which is... Uh, the mask Hindu, they came from India and into our dear Nepal. And then we have uh, Chinese influence, which is, uh, as we mentioned last week, if you still remember, that it was during Tang Dynasty when the uh, king of Tibet married the princess of China, Wen Chen Gongzu, right? And then Buddhism went into Tibet, formally. And from Tibet, since Yuan Dynasty, Tibetan Buddhism went into Nepal. And that's where they clash and they meet. Therefore, giving birth to these two sets of artifacts. I think hopefully with this map, everyone gets a clearer idea on what's going on <laughs> and uh, where we are talking about today. Because uh, if we don't say it, you might misunderstand it as, oh my god, is it Tibet? It's not. It looks a bit Tibetan, it looks a bit Chinese. Yeah, but it's not from these two countries. These artifacts are found, I say one more time, it's in Nepal. Okay, Nipo. Where 
Chinese and Indians, where China and India meet. Am I right? Absolutely, yes. Hopefully this is a yes. clearer unless I will bring this out again, okay, later. Uh, we can see clearly here. So, um, dragons. Shall we start with the dragons first? Absolutely, we start with the dragons. But before I enter into the explanation uh, with you, and uh, I really hope that during the evening, uh, as I comment uh, on the object, uh, if there's any feedback, please provide it to us, because this will help us to enhance the presentation. But I'm just going back to what uh, Mr. Khan mentioned. Right. That in Nepal, in Lumpini. Lumpini. Lumpini, this is the birthplace uh, of the Buddhist. And therefore, one would ask oneself, uh, the country should be a Buddhist uh, country. Right. Now, it's not, or in part, the majority of the people of Nepal, almost 80%, are actually, are actually Hindu. Right. That means that you are saying that in Nepal, now uh, 80%. About approximately eighty percent. About eighty percent, they are their religion. It's Hinduism. Hindu. Hinduism. Hindu. And how many percent? Ten um, percent would actually be Buddhist. About ten percent, Buddhist. And the difference would be other religions, including Catholicism. Oh right. So, uh, even though Buddha was born in Nepal, yes, this is the. Uh, Ratio that we have the now. ratio that we have at the moment. Right. Correct. Okay. Correct. Hundred percent. We know that Hinduism came from India, influence, right? Uh, Buddhism in Nepal, uh, India tried, and of course more came from Tibet, which is uh, true. China, see the path. We have to write this whole thing down into Nepal, and there we have the dragon. Here we have the dragons. Right. 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 Now let me show you. This, it's an identical pair of dragons. Yes. And let me tell you, they're quite heavy, which would lead me to think what kind of metal this would be. Let me assure you that if you are here holding this piece, you will actually be able to discover that this is copper. This is copper? This is copper. Okay. So and this green, is the effect of what they call, the French call the verdries. It's typical to the exposure of the copper to the weather. And of course, in this case, there's also the passage of time. Right. These are twins, as I mentioned. And I have also mentioned in the past that myself, I am a twin. Ah. And for me, it's, it's very important when pieces come as a twin. But when you come and take a look at them, they have totally different character. As much as my character and my personality is very different from my brother. So it's intriguing uh, to me. Now, when we look at this pair of uh, beautiful dragons, uh, and the dragon basically is born in inverted comma in China. Right. So one has to think, uh, how was the symbol basically accepted and made local by the people of Nepal? It's very interesting. Now, we need also to appreciate, and you will appreciate, and I'm sure you know, that the influence of China has been very extensive. And as you know, Tibet, and Tibet basically is one of the borders uh, of uh, Nepal. So there's a lot of exchanges. It's a melting pot of culture, Nepal. In a sense, you're saying that Nepal is actually pretty much like Singapore. So it is. The dragon traveled from oops, the dragon <laughs> traveled from China all the way into Tibet. Absolutely, yes. Probably with the princess, or maybe they have some uh, uh, history of dragon back, but it was more formally accepted. Uh, uh, so the dragon from China flew all the way to Tibet. Yes. And uh, when Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism spread across the world, some, uh, part of it was during Yuan Dynasty. 
So the dragon and then flew into Nepal. Absolutely, together yes, with, uh, So that's how we see the dragon flies. Yes. Right, okay. And we actually have seen in the past uh, dragons being represented uh, and were actually the cover of columns. Uh, we have seen it. Oh, the, um, okay, we the have. Pillar rugs. So if we, we are to trace the path of the dragon, I mean, for China, it's like everywhere, right? Different claws, they mean different things that we all, that you know. Uh, there was one episode we took out this super heavy and super big uh, pillar rugs. They were rugs. meant to wrap around the pillars, and some of them were of the dragon design. Dragon so design. That was when the dragon has arrived in Tibet. Yes. And yes. Uh, then now we're seeing the dragon has actually arrived in Nepal. Yes. So, one little question that I would like to raise with you. If you have an idea where this possibly were used for what part of a building, please share this with us. Let us know what you think. Your opinion, your view is very important to us. Right, so uh, this is copper, it's dragon. Uh, if you want to see it, it's hollow inside. At the back, it's all hollow. Uh, Mr. Pino is asking that, take a guess. Oh my God, it's terribly heavy. Uh, heavy. Take a guess, what is this used for? Okay. Yes. We know pillar, pillar rugs are supposed to be around the pillar for sure. Uh, what did we talk about last week? We talked about the uh, chest with the Pao Okay, you can store stuff. And then the manuscript cover we talked about before. Uh, the elephant, th those are in bronze, copper? Copper again. Copper, copper again. Uh, wall decorations for the altar, probably. What is this used for? Yes. Uh, Tell us. Yeah, try. Uh, you can leave us in the comment to let us know what is it actually used for. So we have the dragon, and inside is actually hollow. In fact, actually, it feels like a glove, but it's going to be a very heavy glove. <laughs> I mean, look at this. I mean, you, you just look at this. It looks it, <laughs> it's like a glove, <laughs> but it's extremely heavy. It is extremely <laughs> heavy. Okay. So okay. if you do oh have God. an idea, ah. please let us know. But before we end this episode, we will definitely be providing some uh, indication of the use. Right. Now, we, let sorry, let's just say hi to some. Uh, we have Jenny, uh, Geraldine, Gillian, Yvonne, uh, uh, Laura, Madam Lai, Eileen, uh, Andy. I see Laura, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, watching. Evening, uh, today, as I said, we are going to travel. We're traveling, in fact. Yes. We are following the path of the dragon from China all the way to Tibet, and now we're in Nepal, where the yes. Himalayas are and where Pudra was born. Uh, yes. But it's a much more complex situation than what we think. Oh, it's just simply Chinese influence. It's not just that, because in front of us, other than this pair of dragons, we also have a pair of masks that has absolute Hinduism influence. That's definitely from India. So yes. we are looking at a place, we are going to travel back in time. We see that a place is landlocked and super influenced by both India and China. So it's not been a case uh, to have chosen from the collection of Master Yun, uh, which is not for sale, uh, as Mr. Khan has already indicated, uh, two beautiful set of artifacts, uh, and one is strongly influenced uh, by India, and the other one is strongly influenced by China right. via Tibet. Let me go to the description so that you can possibly share with me also your view. Keep now, on guessing about what's going on with the keep dragon. Keep on huh? guessing. Now, when we look at this uh, mythical animal, it does not exist. This mythical animal is represented with a wide open mouth. You can see from the sides, we have the teeth. Yes. Then we have the tongue, which is actually coming out. And then we see that there is a big head. Now, what does this head look like? It looks like the head of an animal. And if you guess, it's possible that you will come to a, a, a realistic representation of the head. It's the head of a camel. Head of a camel? This oh. is the head of a camel. Now, on top of that... The camels exist in Nepal? It does not exist oh, in Nepal. Okay. I'm just but curious, yeah. <laughs> the, but the easiest way of representing so that anybody can possibly appreciate the shape is to connect with the head of a camel. Right. Then we see this bulging eyes, 
of a demon, and then we see the eyebrows. And when we look at the eyebrows, they, seem, they look like uh, flames. Now, when we look at the ears, the ears are gentle, are the ears of a cow. Yes. Now, when we look also at the back, you will see that there is the mane. And the mane goes backwards. You know what it makes me think? That some sort of a wind was blowing and the mane went Why? all... And then when we... Because he was flying from Tibet all the way to Nepal. That's it was why. flying. <laughs> and I think it's a very good representation. Now, when we look at the main, we also see on the side the curls. Yes. But let's see what, what, what it represents, uh, the back. The back represents the scale of a fish. Right. But what is most interesting, then on top of the head, we see the trunk, we see the... This thing here. Yes. It's, our, it's, like, it's like your upper lip, this whole portion here. And it's, it's curling. Yeah. an elephant. Oh. So, in other words, the representation of this mythical animal is the combination of various animals. It's really Look, beautiful, I must say. It's yeah. very, very beautiful. And this tells me two things. Yes. Let me just complete by saying, look at the horns. The horns are deer? blunted uh. and look like the horns of a deer. Yeah, right. So they're a combination of a lot of elements. And I quite like this representation because it's a mythical. It does not exist. So it goes with the imagination of the copper smith. Right. And so delicately represented. Now, I said that these are similar. I didn't say that they are identical. Right. And some of the characteristics, the main one, when you will be here, it's basically the skin. When you look at one and you look at the other one, you see different color, which I call technically patina. Right. And the patina is different. So you start to see the differences. So why is the patina different? And usually what happens uh, is when you expose to the weather the copper, the copper changes its color. So from that beautiful reddish color, it changes and becomes, as you see in this case, green. Right. So this is what... Now, I hope somebody of you has an idea of what these elephants, uh, sorry, these dragons were used for. <laughs> I mean, it's again yeah, it's a, if the elephant thing. So <laughs> you know, so we are we are familiar with dragons for sure. I see Eric Kwa, Mr. Kwa is here with us. Ruby is with us as well. These are clients of mine who have bought like double dragon rings. So you will be familiar with dragons. Now today we are plotting the path of the dragon. It sounds like a novel story, huh? A novel uh, story. Not, uh, how it flew from China to Tibet and then into Nepal. And there it rests because after that, if they fly out of Nepal, they will end in India. And there's an, another wave of force coming from India into Nepal. But the first thing is that, what are these dragons used for? I mean, what are they used for? It's, it's heavy. It's, I'm sure it's durable. Uh, because after 100 over years, they are still here and looking all nice except for the rust and all this stuff. So, what are they used for, actually? The use of these are rain outlets. Rain outlets? These are rain outlets. And it's interesting that in Tibet, uh, the dragon is very much assimilated with the serpent. Uh, and then it has spiritual meaning. At the same time, spiritual meaning at the same time, it's recognized for its strength, its ability, its wisdom, and you... I actually have seen them when I visited Nepal at the end of a building, either it be a monastery or a very prestigious, rich house, you would see this rain outlet. Now, please imagine when it rained very heavy, 
you would see out of the mouth. That's the reason why the mouth is wide open. Right. This uh, flush of uh, water coming out. So we are saying that these dragons actually have a very practical societal purpose. Yes. It's actually like part of a drainage system. Uh, in the past, they didn't dig for drains, but when uh, somehow they managed to conduct the water, and you're saying that at the end of this piping system, yes. when the water flows out, yes. and these are fixed onto the end, so that when the water flows out, it flows out of the mouth of the dragon. Am I right? Absolutely right. So the more uh, there is cause to believe that uh, such dragons and the function of this uh, has a great influence from China into Tibet and then into Nepal. Uh, because if you are familiar, and actually I have the photo for it as well, uh, that if you have been to Beijing and you've been to the Forbidden Palace, uh, where the emperor lives in Qing Dynasty and Ming Dynasty and all this, uh, they have similar systems that would have dragons guarding the end of the water outlets. Let's take a look at one of these photos. Look at this. There, there's is of stone, but you can see that the end of the outlets, when it really rains and pours, then you have this dragon thing going on. To unleash, can you imagine how spectacular it would be? Amazing. After a great rain, like all of them would be sprouting water. So this we have, but this is of copper. And uh, same function, same symbol, also the dragon. So there we have, we see that, we see half of what became Tibet, Chinese influence from here. And there's also how China has stepped out its own nation, spread its influence around the world, and there we have evident by the very solid and heavy artifact in my hand today. And what about the masks? I would just like to add a small information. And the small information is uh, the skill of uh, the coppersmith. And this we have many times uh, indicated the repoussé and the chasing technique. The yep. repoussé brings out from the back and instead the chasing in order to have the details uh, is from outside inside so that all the elements uh, come out very neatly and clearly. We have spoken about this strong Chinese influence in these two particular dragons uh, coming from China. And now we go back to the same country, to Nepal, and we examine these two masks. The masks in front uh, of you. So it, you don't have to travel to Nepal, but uh, from the artifacts, you can catch a glimpse of how Nepal is. And I would say by the end of the day, hopefully, that you will feel that Actually, you know, cultural-wise, it's very much like a Singapore. It's a, a, a multi-ethnic country, and many languages uh, are spoken there. They're very gentle sort of people. I've been to Nepal many times, uh, and I've had uh, communication with uh, the people of Kathmandu in particular. Very capital, gentle. Kathmandu. Kathmandu is the capital city of a country of approximately 30 million people. Very gentle, very respectful. So let's go back to the okay, two the masks. masks. Yeah. Now, this is a pair, we said, of the dragons. Uh, this is a set. Right. It's not, it's not a pair. Definitely, a it's a set. Right. And if we are very careful, and if you look carefully, you will be able to distinguish which one of the two masks uh, is actually the male, and which one is the female? Can I guess? You can guess, by I... all means. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at features and adornments, you know, because yes. they all have this... Is this turquoise? Is this a... Uh, turquoise, very good. They, they turquoise. all have this... Yeah, I mean, jewelry is my expertise, yeah. <laughs> turquoise, very <laughs> They all well have done. this turquoise thing, so we can't differentiate from there. I'm, lo I'm looking at how the, the nose is, and how the, 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 the you know, the... the the shape of the face thing. Yes. And uh, this one has some, uh, these are jewels, is it? Uh, like a this, tear this, drop. Uh, like a tiara, you know? This is like a tiara thing, yeah. So I'm guessing that this one that's closer to me, this one is the gentleman, and this one is the lady. Am I right? Or am I wrong? 
You are absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> you can. are absolutely so, right. This is, uh, and you mentioned it's Shiva, so Shiva is a gentleman. So this is Shiva. This is Shiva. And this is? Pavati, the Pavati, wife, the, the wife. consort. And okay, she's okay. the goddess uh, of calmness, of uh, beauty, the goddess uh, that fixes everything. It's ironic you say that she's the goddess of uh, calmness, uh, <laughs> fixes everything. Because, okay, so this is Shiva. This and is that's Shiva. The, that's Pavati. Poverty. Okay. Poverty. So, uh, I, I mean, uh, just for visual better understanding, right next to me here, this is uh, a, a, a crystal sculpture of a Buddha. Yes. Just to let you know that, okay, this is this is the Buddhism side of things, okay? Yes. This is Buddha, and uh, this is the, the prince that was born in uh, India. Uh, and this is the Buddhism dragons, right? Yes. Now, next to you... Uh, you have the mask, and also next to, at the end of it, you have a crystal sculpture that is not Buddha, that is the Ganesha. Now, uh, you as my client, you will be familiar with these cool sculptures you have seen in the gallery before. We have also showed that uh, uh, Ganesha crystals uh, several times, right? Yes. Before the Pavali, we were talking about the pillar of light and so on. Now, what has Ganesha got to do with this uh, set of masks? Because, do you know the story behind? Can I say, I have been told about the story, but not too long ago, I have to say, but you are a, a better position to explain it in detail. Uh, our dear Ganesha is actually a, a, a very famous god, uh, in, in, especially in Singapore, everyone knows about Ganesha, but you know about Ganesha, you might not be clear about how he has an elephant head and about his parents, you know. Everyone has, everyone, some people have uh, quite weird parents, and probably Ganesha is one of them, <laughs> because uh, the parents are Shiva, and poverty. Yes. And uh, 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 what they say is that um, Shiva is a busy man. Okay. He goes out to destroy and create worlds. Destroy and, and create. create worlds. So he left for one of his usual expeditions. And um, and, and in his absence, uh, uh, poverty uh, gave birth to a son. Okay. Uh, and uh, one day she's uh, taking a bath and she told the son to guard the bathhouse, so no one can enter. And uh, so coincidentally, Shiva has finished his mission and came back. And he saw this young man guarding the, uh, his house and uh, not letting Shiva enter. So, of course, you know, as a great god like Shiva, he got angry and then the, the son, whom he, did, he didn't know that he was the son, uh, and Shiva got into a fight. Of course, Shiva won. I mean, he's, the, he's one of the greatest gods. So he won. Um, and he won by behaving the son's head. And um, when Poverty came out of the bathroom, bathhouse, I said, oh my God, you killed your son? That's your son, you idiot. <laughs> so then he said that if you don't fix my son, I'm going to destroy the world or I'm going to destroy the universe. So absolute representation of a woman's wrath. Please be careful about that thing here. <laughs> it's nuts, yeah. <laughs> so I, to cut the story short, uh, Shiva wanted to... Uh, uh, ask a lot of gods to help, and he was given the advice that if you travel east, the first animal you see, you cut, you chop the head off, fix it back on your son. And uh, the first animal that he saw was an elephant. Hence, Ganesha with the elephant head. So there we have family reunion. <laughs> we have a family <laughs> reunion. <laughs> very, very beautiful. But family reunion over here, yeah. When I mentioned earlier that she is a, bone a benevolent... Uh, deity. Mm. It's a mother accepting uh, that the head of the son has been beheaded uh, and then accepting that another head, and in this case the head of an elephant, has right. been replaced and accepting. So she is benevolent uh, in many ways and I'm sure as a wife would not have been an easy task uh, to be with uh, a deity like Shiva who basically had the role of destroying and construction. But there's the destroying aspect, uh, which is very uh, fearful, uh, I, I would say. Now, let's describe a little bit uh, Shiva, and then we will go to Bhavati, and let's see the difference. Again, right. this are wife and husband. They don't share the same characteristic but they do share something significant. It's the air drop jewel. The turquoise here. Turquoise. Turquoise, am I right? Yes. 
And let's not forget that turquoise is one of the stone that is actually mined uh, in uh, Nepal. Ah, okay. Yes. That explains. Yeah, that yeah. explains. And that explains also the provenance. Now, what happens uh, when we look at Shiva, how can we detect that this is a male figure? It's about the moustache. Oh, I missed that thing. Oh, yeah. And the moustache yeah, goes correct. upward. And Shiva, in his representation, is always with moustache. Right. Now, what is this teardrop jewel? What does it represent? Do you have a clue of what it represents? Let me tell you. This represents the third eye. So in other words, what the vision that the eyes cannot capture is captured by the third eye. Right. And we have seen, and which means also enlightenment. And then if we go back to the representation of the Guanin, we have shown two or three Guanin in the collection of Master Yun. They all had this uh, enlightenment sign on the forefront. I see. It's, uh, it's, uh, coincidentally, it's quite a uh, common thing among gods, even in the Chinese world. God and goddesses. Yeah, God and goddesses. Uh, in the Chinese world, you have the third, you open your, there's a saying in Chinese, well, <laughs> open your third eye and you can have some enlightenment stuff. Yes. So it's beautiful, this kind of vision that only deities can have beyond the normal sight. Now, let's go back to the eyes. They share the same kind of eyes where the pupils are basically open. So when this mask was worn, whoever would wear this mask would be able actually to see through. So we are talking about masks, and this mask in the most literal and real sense, it's actually for wearing. This is for wearing. And copper as well. Is this copper? Copper. Uh, it's a heavy mask. Okay, so it's for wearing because if you look at the bag, uh, of course, all the techniques are fabulous. You see that it has this thing here. Actually, it feels, if you've been to the army before, it feels like a helmet because they have this padding. They have this very nicely done, this padding here, so it doesn't scratch your face. Yes. Thing. And then behind this cloth, I suppose it's supposed to put at the back. At the back, they over have, your hair. They have this thing, so you can untie it and retie it according to your head size. And they would perform as Shiva and Parvati. Absolutely, yes. So upon wearing the mask, you transform and you are... The, the god and goddess, maybe for some ritual, maybe for some performances, I, I, I don't know. So it's yes. supposed to be like that. Can I try? What I yes. Is it clean? <laughs> so it's supposed to be, it, and this is supposed to be at the back. Huh? Yeah. It's supposed to be at the back. See, I'm trying always to delay trying this thing. <laughs> oh, there's a dragon here as well, yeah. So it's supposed to be something like this. Oh my god, yeah. It's supposed to be something like this, and you can see through the eyes. It, that's where the that's where the hole is, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. Am I right? Yes. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. So this is oh my god, yeah. Now when you look at the hair, and you will be see, you will be able to see the hair here. It's all curly, and then it ends up with uh, a bun. So this is the representation of Shiva. Interestingly, if you look. Shiva, basically, in the mythology of uh, the people of Nepal, right. was incarnated and, and became Pashupati. And Pashupati is basically the deity of Nepal. I see. It's Shiva. So it's the, de the, the deity that looks after the animal. So the incarnation of Shiva is actually Pashupati. Now, if you ever have been to Kathmandu, I'm sure this is one of the temples uh, that you have been able to see. An amazing temple. Only Buddhists and only Hindus are able to visit. So you're no. saying that this is a temple that has both Buddhists and in Hinduism in it. 
is a yeah. is so interesting. I have, uh, I have entered uh, not Pashupatinath because I'm not, uh, I was not allowed, but many mm. small temples, and both the two religion basically are celebrated in the same place. And you would actually be able to see the deities, which are specifically Hindu deities, and then you would also be able to see Buddhist deity. You know, there's such a sense of respect for one another. And I can imagine an Hindu temple, an Hindu monastery, opening the door to the Buddhist and vice versa. Amazing. Does it happen in other religion? I don't know. But definitely this is one of the characteristics uh, of uh, this wonderful place, uh, Nepal, and I have witnessed it myself. So this is, uh, this is Shiva. Now, let's go to the wonderful wife. The wife, yeah. I mean, if you see, she has an oblong face. She has basically the headgear, and the headgear is represented by flowers and foliage. I see, yes. And if you actually go through the valleys uh, of uh, Nepal, uh, you would be able to see women uh, who wear this wonderful flower around uh, their heads. You've got to buy the jewellery for the wife, huh? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, regarding other characteristic, uh, making the difference, uh, if you see one of the lobes uh, of the ear, ah, it's actually, yes. actually a hole. And from here, there would have been a long earrings, which is missing, uh, which would beautify poverty. Right. Other differences is basically the simplicity of the air, again, all held back, and the bun at the same time. Interestingly, you would see some red pigments uh, on both the two masks. Again, she was represented, this time it's my turn. Oh, you're poverty, I see. That's how it goes. So pop, you are poverty, and if we fall down on this mask in that st special ceremony, and I am playing the character of Shiva then, am I right? I, I can see you actually. Yeah, I can see it. Definitely. There we have it. Yes. Right. I think both oh of God, us I'm masking you. <laughs> both of us need a shampoo immediately. <laughs> okay. But it's interesting because even the textile, I think it's contemporary. And as Mr. Khan has mentioned earlier, both at the bottom and on the top, there's a way it's, yeah. that, that's uh, a padding not to hurt the top of the head and, uh, and uh, the, the bottom I of see. the face. I see. I mean, it really connects. We have a family reunion of uh, 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 Hinduism over there. Yes. Father, mother, and the son, unfortunately, beheaded. And uh, we have uh, Puda and then the... Uh, dragons from Tibetan Buddhism that went to Nepal and actually in this narrow strip of land in Nepal uh, Chinese and India influence one more time that they all come and they meet at the same places as you mentioned I like the uh, the whole thing about there was this temp there are several temples that are actually open to both Buddhists and Hindus right in this narrow stretch of land in Nepal it's uh, stunning I mean the coming together of cultures as well I would say that it's a bit like how Singapore is like, right? And we know that Singapore and Nepal has a great history, a lot of dealings, and in fact, uh, some of our special police force, special Kirkans, they are from Nepal. Yes. They're from this Nepal, re from this Nepal region. Now, I have with me something interesting before I go on to say, I talk about Master Yin's art, is that Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, uh, despite their differences coming together, they have a lot of similarities in a way. Um, there is this uh, very limited collection that I have now that is actually shared and uh, preferred and uh, beloved by both Hindus and uh, Buddhists. 
and um, and it's this. I don't think I've showed you before. It's this what we call the one zero eight bits. In fact, what we have in our hand today is the Aga Wood version of the one zero eight bits. These one zero eight, this number is super significant in both Buddhism and Hinduism. I have uh, talked about it many a times. Like for the uh, Hindus, um, Mount Verdu, if I'm right. Uh, they already know about the cosmologies and uh, there are 108 stars and so on. So Hinduism, 108 is a great number and uh, they will use this as a, you know, like a prayer beat. In Buddhism as well, 108 it refers to the 108 kinds of troubles or fortunes. Uh, significant number, that's why you see them holding this as a praying thing as well. Now I especially brought this out because we used to have a lot more of this. Several years ago, we have at least a few trays of this. Trays. And now? And now I have only three. This is the last three that you have. Yes. I have only three. So I especially brought this out uh, with today. Uh, I didn't intend to, but I was looking at, hey my god, this is a connection between both Buddhism and Hinduism as well. So uh, for those who are looking for 108 bits, for if you are looking for Aga word, then I would say that uh, be it whichever size it is, this is a big size, and they're all at the same price anyway. Yeah, uh, all authentic and super rare and precious agar wood. Only three pieces. Only three pieces, okay. Uh, in last year, there was one string that was half done, and it was just straight away reserved by a client. So I will, like, once it's done, I will take it, but I'll pay, uh, pay for it first. It was half done, so it's, it, it will go in such a flash. Uh, if you're looking for Aga Wood, once you have which I think eventually everyone should have, um, it's a part of your Feng Shui criteria to have Aga Wood. These are great options. Grab your your. Can you tell me what is, the, <laughs> Mr. Khan, the function? I no. mean, you put it around your wrist. Yeah, like this, yeah. There I have, you see, I have, I have one around my wrist. Some people don't wear it at the wrist, some wear it as a necklace, yeah. Right. And uh, as long as it's with you, actually, it would give you a sense of calmness, yes, it will get rid of obstacles and convert them into opportunities, wow. benefactors and direct wealth. That's, these are the main functions of Aga Wood. And depending on which religion you fall into, 108 will have a different effect as well. So it's really the connection of these two religions that we are talking about. And of course, when we are talking about these two things coming together in this narrow stretch of land, uh, we can actually imagine that Nepal is like a canvas. When Indian influence came in, when Chinese influence came in, and they just painted Nepal in its own colours, coming together excitingly, beautifully, colourfully as well, right? That's why we have all these precious artefacts in front of us. It's just like Master Yun's art. There's no rejection. It's not rejecting the, oh no, I'm, I'm pro-China. No, I'm pro Even today, Nepal is still like this. If they get too close on one side, the other side will get a bit angry. Yes. So it, it, yes. Is, it is a consortium. It is a, 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 a cauldron of uh, where these cultures meet. Uh, so it's pretty much like Mastering's art as well, uh, where the yeast and West meet. We've talked about this so many times, where the, the new and old meet. You have the old ways of painting. You have the new materials like the acrylic paint. That's totally new. Um, inside one canvas, not extremely big, that the size is uh, appropriate that you can put at home several pieces at the same time and you can get a mix and a, a coming together of different faiths, cultures, all together. Now, you know, when different pe people of different faiths, they come and look at Mastering's painting, they have a different feel. I'm not sure whether you have the same thing or not because you feel a different thing when you look at Mastering's painting. Uh, silver means differently for Catholics and for the Chinese. For, the, for, for Catholics, it means that it's uh, to ward off evil yes. because of the whole Judah story. And uh, in Chinese, silver actually means victory. It actually means as a common currency for the, for the many, many dynasties. So the material is there. Everyone will come in from a different perspective to understand it better, just like how our dear Nepal is today. East and West, China and India, new and old, all at the same place. If you can uh, have yourself, do I interpret yep. correctly that the painting by Master Yun behind you yep. represents a peacock? 
Yeah, both of the are peacocks. And speaking of these exact paintings, um, a special highlight is that now these two, if you can see, there's a tag at the top right corner. Uh, these are paintings that just came back from Art Beyond Museum, Ping Nang edition. Right. They traveled to Ping Nang and yes. they're back. These cranes flew to Ping Nang and now they are back. Okay, for instance, this piece uh, behind me, this crane, uh, gentle, okay, looking into the ground. Uh, it's featured in episode 1, 4, 7, and 10 of the Penang series. So it's been to several places as you can see. And yours, the one next to you, is the highlight of the whole season because this painting has been to seven places in Penang. Seven places. You can come and count yourself and seven places in Penang. So uh, we see the same Huang He Yongsen crane of Everlasting Victory series. But these are the ones that went to Penang. So my friends, when you're watching this now, this is important because for many a times you have been asking, that, oh my God, the paintings in Penang, they're not going to come back to Singapore uh, because Gibson just made his trip to Singapore. So he brought himself, he brought, he handheld these paintings um, throughout the whole flight and brought several, not all, but some key highlights, selected ones to Singapore to share with you. Uh, and uh, because of how the flights are nowadays, he had to take a business class for it. So these cranes came on the business class flight from Penang <laughs> to Singapore. Now to extend it and to remind is that uh, this couple of days, uh, Gibson, he is uh, setting up the place uh, with all these Penang paintings. Now this Sunday is exciting. Actually this week is exciting. Huh? Uh, this Friday is the first of a lunar month. So it's great for you to get started with your agar beads, uh, crystals, and so on. Now this Sunday, which is the last day of July, 31st of July at 4.30 p.m. You remember Mr. Daisuke san Yes. The Japanese? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the wine champion, yes. uh, the sommelier superstar. Yes. He'll be back. Now this time around he's back, he's not going to pair his wine with me. He's still going to have art wine pairing with Mastering's art, but specifically Chosen, chosen paintings and calligraphies belonging to the Art Beyond Museum Penang series. Right. Right. So these paintings coming back, it's really quite a uh, stunning thing. Come by here and see which one matches your wall and your taste. Bring them back. And also this Sunday, if you haven't signed up, 4.30 p.m., it's going to be the Art Wine Pairing Session. Gibson's introducing the Art Beyond Museum Penang paintings and calligraphies and with Tai Tsuke Sang bringing... He hasn't told me yet, but he asked me a few questions today and he said, that, okay, I will go back and think seriously about the pairing. So, I, I, it's, it's going to be, because remember the last session, yes. you can really taste the paintings through the wine. Am I right? You can really taste, like how we're doing, that we can really go into the world of mastering through this not-for-sale artifacts. Then we realize, oh my God, actually there's a lot of connection between a lot of things that's happening. So this Sunday, remember to come over here Sign up, bring your friends, especially if they have, have not been really exposed to Lotus on Water. Bring your friends uh, this Sunday to enjoy and to taste the paintings. Taste the paintings that are just back from Penang. Through the wine pairing. Through the wine pairing, through the art wine pairing, right? Okay, so sign up. You can tell me in the comments. You can actually just text us uh, to sign up for this, right? Uh, we have to select the winners from yes. last week. Right, well, we also have to ask the question for this week. Um, I like to keep things simple. I'm not going to ask about their names because I think most of them can't even spell it. We, we follow a trend uh, from last week because we are saying that the Pao Zhang Hua, the flower, and the elephant went to Tibet from China. And today we are tracking the whole thing from Tibet. After China's influence, it went into Nepal. Uh, and the creature that we are following, where it flies. What are these two mythical creatures? Simple. Something you are familiar with, you just never knew that it flew so far from China to Tibet, Tibet to Nepal. And we actually haven't tracked the other side of things. Uh, we haven't tracked the east side because the dragon also flew to Japan and Korea as well. And in fact, Bhutan also has a dragon on their flag. So it flew everywhere. So what are these pair? of mythical and wonderful creatures that you are so familiar with that actually tells us that the Chinese culture has spread beyond the borders of mainland China. What are these? 
that you have, this Pinot has spent a great effort to describe the different features on it, right? Just type in the comments, what are these two amazing, powerful, nonetheless mythical creatures that actually binds different countries and cultures together, all right? Let's, let's choose three people. We are. Yeah. Number one, we have uh, Claire Key. Congratulations. Congratulations. Right. Number two, we have Stephen Le. Quite a few times I've selected this guy. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Remember the question is that what are the what are these two? Not what are they used for, just what are they? Are they cows? Are they tigers or what? What are these two mythical ones? Okay. And the third one we have Claire Lim. Congratulations, one Claire, Key, Claire. One Claire Key, one Claire Lim. Okay, wow, a lot of Claire's happening. Right, so just type your answer into the comments uh, now. And uh, what are these two for? Uh, I don't know what these two for. What are these two? Yes, you know? what do they represent? Yeah, what, are, what is the motive? What is the, what is the creature that, is, that these two represents? It's simple. It's something we are all familiar with. Some of you are wearing it. Uh, so just type in the comments, right? Uh, and with that, remember this Sunday we have 4.30 art wine pairing. We invited Mr. Taisuke Sang back into a, at the Lotus Gallery to pair wines with masters, paintings and calligraphies that are back from Penang Art Beyond Museum series. Right? Very good. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>